mention of uh, different companies developing AI first. Uh, would there be a possibility or any suggestion to buy shares in specific companies or set up an AI hedge fund with like multiple uh, companies that are moving towards that faster than others? Like, so Money will be dead Well, the, I mean, open. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the biggest group of people working toward AGI are, are, is Google DeepMind. But of course, buying shares in Alphabet, you're buying shares in a lot of different things, right? The, the Singularity Net project that I just described, which is a sort of decentralized economy of, of, of AIs, we're going to do an, an ICO, an initial coin offering for that later this fall, probably in, in, in November. So if you if you're into crypto projects, you can you can invest in that. Our our OpenCog AI project is an open source project, so you can donate to it if you want, but 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 you can, you can't invest in it. And I mean that that's intentional. I really think it's better for the first AGI is not in itself a, a commercial enterprise. I, I, I like the, the open, open source moda, modality. Right? Anybody want to ask a question? One over here. You all seem to uh, feel a very strong sense of guardianship or responsibility for what happens. How much do you think that programmers or developers working within corporations like Google have an ability to act on what they think is responsible programming? So one quick answer is, in the Manhattan Project, the scientists strongly advocated to the uh, president at that time not to use the bomb, but they were completely ignored. So basically, who owns it makes the decisions. And what the scientists think really doesn't matter. OK, to give some positive answer, at least. <laughs> <laughs> At least the DeepMind branch of Google, they have an ethics team, you know, really, you know, highly qualified scientists who um, research about, um, you know, AGI safety. Um, so at least they are concerned with this and um, deal with it. Probably they will be ignored then in the end also. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the CEO of the company has a fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder value, right? So, I mean, if, if of course, if they have a robot that will annihilate everyone, that they, they won't, they won't, they, they probably won't release it, even if that would maximize their bank account. But where, where there's more of a judgment call, of of course, if you're the CEO of a public company, there is, there is some push to do what will maximize your 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 share value, right? So, I mean, in in reality, the decisions are usually kind of borderline and and complicated. But I mean, you know, in. in Largely, this is true, but you know, even company bosses, you know, have some sometimes moral values. And I mean, see Bill Gates, you know, he donates, you know, billions of dollars because he's retired. He, he's no longer yeah. maximizing yeah. shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So professionals like healthcare professionals can say, "I cannot do this; it breaches my code." What would give you power? Being the CEO. I, I, I mean, that, that's hard to say. I, I mean, I, honestly. AI projects to build to to do research and discover a new algorithm you can do on your own, and a researcher could say, "Well, I discovered this amazing learning algorithm, but I'm not going to release it." But practical engineering projects of building AGIs, it takes a lot of people to build a distributed system that can run on a lot of machines and deal with sensors and actuators and all different types of data. So the, this is always going to be. I think it's going to be a big team effort. So that I mean, any one person could quit the project. But I mean, even if the project leader got cold feet and didn't like the project, I mean, if it's being successful, there's a whole team and 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 and, and the company around it, and these things get get a certain momentum. So I I I, I don't think an individual programmer working on a project has too much power to stop a successful project if they're, they're wor worried about it or something. I, but I mean, I, I do think most science and tech geeks do not want to destroy the world, right? I mean, if you think about it, like the, the amount of passion, energy, and intelligence that goes into a startup company, if that went into doing destructive things, would see a lot more scary and powerful destructive technologies around. So I mean, o o overall, 
most people who are leading AI projects do actually want them to do good for the world and, 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 and help people, the difficulties are, are more subtle ones because everyone wants to do good and help people while also making money for their company. And if you get a situation where there's some weird conflict there that's hard to sort out, then it's hard to say what would happen. As a counterpoint in the Manhattan Project, initially the scientists in the Manhattan Project were so worried that Germany would get the bomb first that they were working furiously to, to make it happen. But towards the end, it was pretty clear Germany was not pursuing the, the weapon. But by that point, they were so technically involved, they'd lost sight of the, of the dangers and the risks that were associated with it. That wasn't true of all of them, but it was true of the majority. There's also a difference. In fact, in the time mm -hmm. of the Manhattan Project, most of the involved physicists were also public intellectuals that intensely reflected on the political situation and uh, participated in the political discussions and wrote letters to their respective presidents who were consulting with them and so on. And this is a situation that seems to be very uh, unlike the current situation. Can you imagine the current set of presidents conversing with AI nerds about uh, how to make proper laws and these being enacted? This is just not the process that we have anymore in governing oh, oh, countries. Oh, oh, Obama did some of that. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you know, uh, if even if a reasonable country would uh, set reasonable incentives and reasonable laws and so on, we would still have unreasonable countries like, say, Theresa May or North Korea who would come up with their own AI projects. We're building a robot, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> so another data point. There's an interesting video on the, on, um, uh, on the internet with Elon Musk. It's the, in the interview, he says he tried to persuade Sergey Brin and Mark Zuckerberg that this was a serious problem, and they just didn't think it was. And these are the people who will actually make the decisions. Another issue is that uh, if you are nu have nuclear bombs, if you want to build them, you need a giant infrastructure to make that happen. It doesn't only cost uh, not billions of dollars, but you also need to have all these centrifuges and access to certain raw materials and so on. This is not the case for AI. For AI, you just need reasonably large computers that are not that hard to come by, and you need to have uh, the right ideas how to do it. And once some team has figured out how to do it, it's very, very hard to keep it under wraps. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, somebody has to get in there and steal the secret sauce, because most of the ideas are probably already out there. And once you have an idea how they got it to work, a number of people will follow shortly afterwards with similar solutions. It was suggested earlier that it might not be in the best interests of an AGI for the populace to know about it, and it might not also be in the best interests of the corporation that owns it. So how long do you think after we have AGI, do you think people will actually know about it? It depends on who actually is control at that time. If they really want to keep it secret and they use the power of the AGI to ensure that happens, then I can't see why it wouldn't be, remain secret indefinitely. Well, I think that's extremely unlikely, personally. I mean, I, 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 it's not impossible, but it seems to me that, you know, when someone gets to, say, a toddler level AI that has common sense of a three or four year old child, the odds are very high they're going to show that off to the world and everyone will know about it, the same way we learned about AlphaGo and, and Watson and so forth. And then once you're at that level, then everyone in the scientific community is going to realize like we're in a different phase of the game and are moving from toddler level AI on toward like adult human level AI. And there's going to be a lot of teams working on that in parallel. And as, as Josh has just said, I mean, I think once you're at that level, many teams are going to be racing. Someone will get there first, but then someone else will get there soon after. And you know, it's not very feasible that someone's going to have a team of top AGI researchers working sealed off in a basement somewhere and not telling anyone what they're doing. It's not impossible, but the way things seem to be working is this work is being done in companies or open source projects with a lot of turnover of staff and, and le leakage of ideas, which just increases the odds that you know, a similar breakthroughs are occurring in a lot of different places. And that's certainly what we're seeing in the AI community right, right now, anyway. Right? But if Google will build AI, then we will not only know the day they build it, Ray Kurzweil will as te tell us about it 30 years before that. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I'll just point did. out that all of these corporations keep their major projects very much under wraps. So I don't, even though I live in Silicon Valley, I don't really know what Google is doing in the AI area. Well, I know what Google is doing in the AI area, and I don't. How you know often, what they say they're How doing. often do you visit their office? I mean, never. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, companies and corporations are supported by the people who consume their products. If we consume Facebook products or Google products, then we are supporting Google's and Facebook's vision of what AGI is and what its initial commands and moral framework will become. What can I do as a consumer to make ethical choices? And are there any companies, corporations, individuals or otherwise that you would recommend for the pursuit of ethical AGI development? It's a hard one. Well, Tesla probably. Um, I think that uh, Elon Musk is the one who is most concerned with humanity's fate and most driven by this uh, in, in control. I think that Google was originally uh, built with a transhumanist vision too. Uh, of course, these are uh, machines. Google and all the other corporations are in some sense um, autonomous agents uh, that are built to generate money and uh, people and shareholders have limited influence on this because they are part of an evolutionary environment in which the fitness function is how much shareholder value they can gen generate. And if you are a large corporation, this limits your scope of like, activity if you want to stay in business. I mean, you could read sort of, you know, the small print when you, you know, always, you know, you have 10 pages and you click just, you know, I accept, accept, you know. Some companies have, you know, better privacy policies. For, I mean, just as an example, right, you know, if you use chat, um, systems, there's so many out there, and um, you know, some just grab your own, you know, phone book and distribute it to everyone, and and some, you know, give you a choice, right? As an example, and but, I mean, it doesn't really help you, right? If you want to communicate with your Facebook friends, you need Facebook. You cannot go to a different platform, so. Yeah, but your harsh. choice as a consumer is very limited, or your power as a consumer. What can you do as a consumer to make Apple have a decent ports and not something from a parallel universe? Nothing. <laughs> uh, no, don't buy Apple. I mean, there's a real alt alternative, right? Yeah, buy but I think that Apple will not change its, its view. Yeah, but well, then they will go down in the long run. Maybe not because of yeah, the ports, but, but because of other things, what, right? Uh, how mean, can you convince Microsoft then to you have Mac OS or something? Basically, as a consumer, you only have a very, very small marginal uh, yeah, but in this different. case, I mean, sort of, we have Android, we have sort of Windows, and we have iOS, right? In this case, at least the consumer has a choice, and more or less you can choose, right? If I want to communicate with my Facebook friends, I need Facebook. I cannot use something else. Yeah. There is no choice. But if but you want to change something, I think you need to go to the top. It's like in, uh, in society, uh, as a voter, you cannot change society to a large degree. As somebody who takes to the streets, you cannot change society. Voting is a way to give legitimacy to something. It's not a way to change it or to find the best policy. If you want to change something, you need to take a talk to the people in charge or become one of them. So ultimately, we don't really have any power about what's going to happen. No, you have a lot of power. You can get to power. You are very powerful. You are a smart person. You can start a company. You can walk your way to Davos. You can talk to people uh, that take you seriously if you have something ser serious to say. Yeah, but not everyone can sort of become politically active, you know, for, uh, as, as their primary job, right? So the question is, what can the majority of people do who have sort of, you know, maybe 1% of their time to spare, right? And with a limited, yeah. there, there's some choice you can make with products, right? And just, you know, stay away from them, which have bad policies, but it is very hard in some cases, you know, like messenger platforms, but I easier. mean, this, this ties into my motivation to create AGI open source, more like Linux than like OS X or, or, or Windows. I mean, that, that doesn't guarantee that it's made ethically and for the common good uh, either, but it, do, it does mean that it's not locked into some corporate organism whose explicit goal is to maximize shareholder value at the, at the ex expense of, of everything else. So, I mean, it, it at least and at least avoids having the AGI locked into an, an essentially malevolent goal structure, but it, but it doesn't, it, it, it just leaves things more, more open. It, 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 it doesn't guarantee a good, a good outcome either. So yeah, I, I would say, in my view, the best hope is to develop AGI open source and then have a wide variety of different parties 
leverage that to do good in, 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 a, in a variety of different ways. So, I, I mean, as, as an example, now we're pretty far from human level AGI, but our OpenCog, open source AI system, after our Ethiopian software developers started working on it on an outsourcing basis, some undergrad students there took the OpenCog system and put it on some Raspberry Pi, which was put in the toy robot, which is now being sold to universities in, in Ethiopia for education purposes, right? So there you, you put some AI software open source and it lets students take it and then use it to do things in, 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 in their own country by hacking and messing with it. So if you, if you multiply that by a million, right, then, then, then maybe you have something that can, can really disseminate AI technology for good as, as, it, as it develops. So um, I wanted to bring up something that's more of an immediate issue. And uh, as you probably know, the, the open AI letter on autonomous weapons uh, came out about it a year ago. And um, one of the things they talked about was how uh, autonomous weapons are going to be the Kalashnikovs of the future. That, um, as you mentioned, it's, it, you don't need uh, a cyclotron or anything to have an, an AI that could fly, a, do face recognition, and fly a drone, and you know do a targeted assassination. And uh, when terrorists get a hold of these, um, you know that that's something that I think we really do have to worry about now. Uh, I worry more about the U.S. government having a hold of them. That they seem to have a lot and to be blowing up a lot of people. Yeah, but well, sure. But um, the the problem is that they're much more portable than nuclear weapons, right? So, and and they're cheaper, and you know, so uh, you know, just about anybody could get one. I mean, right now the. ISIS is using autonomous, uh, or not autonomous, sorry. They're using drones to fly bombs into people. Um, the, you know, they're not AI drones, but it's not that far a stretch to think about, uh, you know, they're, they're able to see better than us. They're uh, probably then going to be able to aim better <coughs> than us. And we've already weaponized them when they're driving our cars. Well, I agree with your overall point. If AGI gets out in the form of many separate AGIs that anyone can replicate, then even though the vast majority of people would only use them for useful or benign uh, purposes, you don't need many uh, radicals with crazy ideas to use it in a malignant way. And because it's so much more powerful, the damage it could do would be so much greater. And this has been true throughout history. As military technology gets better at killing people, the ability for a small number of people using it to inflict enormous damage increases. But I don't think the main risk, you said it's a near-term question. I mean, the main <coughs> risk is not much to do with AGI. I mean, I, I lived in, DC for nine years and did a bunch of AI work for various government agencies, some for INSCOM, Army Intelligence. And I mean, what, what you see there is the military wants AIs that will act according to doctrine and obey orders and be quite precise in, in what they do. And my, my own gut feeling is that's not especially compatible with being at the vanguard of AI, AGI R&D. I mean, early stage AGIs are gonna make mistakes and they have to experiment and learn and be a bit unpredictable. And what, I mean, what the military wants is something that will always act within certain constraints. They're, they're not gonna be in the vanguard of AGI, and, and, and they're not now, it's other commercial companies, that they're gonna create narrow AI killing machines that, that carry out specific recognition and movement and planning tasks oriented toward spying on who they want to spy on and then killing who they want to kill. And it's, it's a narrow AI mixed with other technologies problem. And by the time you get to 
what, what I think will happen is some other sector of the economy will get to AGI while the military is making powerful narrow AI killing machines, and right, then. I'm not talking about the AGI. Yeah. So the hope, the hope in my mind, is that the AGIs that are built outside the military will be benevolent and will then become more of a force in society than the human-controlled military's killer narrow AIs. But I'm also regarding ISIS, though. It's true, ISIS has some drones, but I mean, like U.S. and Chinese army have a lot nastier drones, right? So, I mean, so, so, so far, it seems it's the governments that are at the vanguard of, of sophisticated killer technology, not, not random terrorist groups. And I, I have no reason to suspect that that will not tend to continue, right? So, I mean, and if that's true, then governments will, will keep on winning. And whether you want to consider governments terrorist organizations as well as a matter of your politics, I guess. Uh, I have what might be a very naive question, but artificial intelligence has many obvious applications, but artificial general intelligence, as I understand, is a quantum leap above that. Lots of corporations are working on it. When they finally achieve it, how are they going to roll it out into a product that makes vast amount of, amounts of money for them? Are we all going to have artificial general intelligence on our desktop or on our pocket? or I mean, In the cloud. Yeah. I, but that's like one artificial intelligence, right? How do they really make their money back? Well, in a lot of ways, right? If you think about, if you had an AGI at human level and you could copy it and teach it anything, presumably that AGI would then be able to do every job humans can do. I mean, that's been proposed as a test of whether it's a really powerful AGI anyway. So then the, the answer would be by displacing every single human being from their job by doing their job better than them. And that, I mean, that devolves into hundreds of thousands of, of answers because there's, there's a lot of different thing, things to do. Right? Or to yeah. give some concrete examples before that happens. I mean, if we have well-developed robotics, you know, elderly care, um, lots of people are needed there. This is expensive. So if we have robots with some form of intelligence, right? Not, not, we don't need company CEO AGIs, right? It's just robots which can take care of old people, right? That would be a huge market, yeah? And the other market is personal assistants, right? Like Siri, but just much smarter, you know, like, you know, a good yeah, assistant, you know, a company or so. So that is everyone's personal operating system? Yeah, that, that would be maybe the first step, and then, you know, then we come to Ben's. It's hard to know what will be the first step, because it just depends on cost and economic dynamics, right? Like right, right now, without advanced AI, we could replace all humans in every McDonald's, right? I mean, there wouldn't have to be a human walking around or flipping the burger. I mean, we could replace that with like automated burger and fry production and toilet and floor cleaning machines. And that will happen, right? There's some McDonald's where you can type your order in on a tablet rather than tell it to a human. The, the reason it hasn't happened yet is it's basically still cheaper to pay humans and to build all that machinery, and the cost will come down dur during the next decade. So yeah, the I think the question is uh, uh, going somewhere deeper. There is the big problem that we need to reorganize the way resources are allocated in society in a big way. For instance, uh, as Ben points out, we will replace most of the jobs in retail, or all of them in the near term. Um, we will uh, also re uh, replace drivers and so on. We will replace many, many jobs irrevocably. Uh, unlike you, I hope that many of the jobs uh, that have to do with interaction between people will not be done by robots, but can be done by people, because mm -hmm. we will have an enormous amount of people that will have a lot of free time and might enjoy interacting with each other and do the things that humans are best at. Uh, so uh, especially things like education, nursing, and so on don't need to be done by robots or automated software. They, these are things where people can really interact with each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now, these things don't make a lot of profit which is why we have a shortage of labor in these areas. But generally, we have a labor surplus, and that's the issue. So uh, right now, we don't have a societal acceptable way to reroute money into these jobs, because this would mean public employment. If you want to make public employment, it means in some sense that the state has to generate money and has to take out money on another point. It's not because the amount of money needs to be uh, is finite and we need to mine it out of the ground otherwise, but you need to have some kind of balanced economy. 
So for instance, if inflation is a flat tax on portfolios in some sense, um, if you manage to raise uh, wages together with inflation, you just melt down the portfolios. This is one way. But we haven't done this in the right way, and the worldwide economy is still in an incredible imbalance and uh, bound to blow up at some point, as most people think. Um, th this is one of the issues that we are facing, and this issue is going to be dramatically aggravated with the fact that labor is no longer going to be the primary means of telling people how much bread they are going to have on their table. And it's not because of a shortage of bread. We can have more bread than yesterday. We can have better housing, better transportation, better infrastructure, better everything. We only need to have, uh, find a decent way to distribute this among people. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what, one possible outcome is there's like a thousand really rich people, probably mostly white guys from the West and a few rich Chinese guys. These thousand rich people own a bunch of robot factories that mine raw materials and make them luxury goods and deliver to them by drones then everyone else is shut out of that economy, then the Africans are the only ones who survive because they still remember how to do subsistence farming. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, that, that, that's to the extreme, but that is sort of one direction the world economy gradually seems to be going in. And it's but actually very unlikely. Yeah, of would course mean that, uh, Of course, there's <laughs> going to be uh, yeah. an, another secondary economy. There's going to be riots and so on. I don't think this is going to happen. Probably it's not. It's very unrealistic. No. Something else will something else will intervene along the way. But the but for that not to happen, radical changes to economy and society and government policy will, will have to occur. And there are some very straightforward changes. One very straightforward change is to have massive increase in public employment. So who gives universal basic income to the Central African Republic? I'm not sure if universal basic income is the right solution in general, because right now uh, labor also has another function, integrate society. And uh, there's a very big danger of right now already in the U.S. the society is disintegrating along many fault lines. People have the impression that they are no longer part of the same food chain. And this is very dangerous, because uh, ultimately it means war. It means my kids should be fed, your kids cannot be fed. We are in conflict. <laughs> if my ki before my kids are going to die, yours are going to die. I make sure of that. This is a situation that you don't want to have. So when you see people in Charlottesville in the US uh, running around and uh, yelling, the Jews will not replace us, what they express is they have the impression they are being replaced. They can no longer feed their kids. And you can say that they're despicable and so on, but if you look at the world through their eyes, and they might be most modeling the world, as they certainly are, uh, that's their impression. And it's a very dangerous impression to have. And uh, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. And if you pay, can pay people to be good members of society, for being teachers, students, artists, uh, cooks, whatever people like to do with each other, that is actually a very good thing. Another point to bring out is when an entirely new technology enters into society, it can do functions which we already know about, and a lot of them were mentioned here, but there'll be new functions we haven't even thought about yet. Yeah. So the telephone, people thought the main use would be uh, transmitting music. The fact that people would talk to each other was not considered. Uh, lasers, when they were invented, no one thought you'd use them for uh, recording materials. So inventions come along, and they often have uses that we can't f foresee right now. And the, uh, an AGI is, has almost unlimited potential in transforming through entirely new uses. We know about many AI systems now uh, developing. Uh, there was the expression here that you know, war is about AGI multiple systems. Practical question, how many AGI systems are now in the world developed? How, how many have been developed or how yeah, many? No, no, how many have been developed? Yeah, it's a, part of uh, open code. I mean, that, 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 that's a fuzzy set, right? Because, I mean, at, 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 this, at this point, I would guess there's close to, I don't know, 100 little companies around the world which have AGI as, as, an, as an aspiration and they're doing some work a a aimed in that direction and pro probably, probably a few hundred researchers in universities around the world w w working, in, working in that direction. 
I mean, that might be off by a small integer. It's not off by like 10 or 100 or something, though. But then many of these are very small efforts, right? And there, there's not that many efforts that have a lot of, of resources or, 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 or people behind them. I think the, the best funded and biggest projects aimed toward the AGI now are in, in big tech companies, right? I mean, in Baidu, Tencent opened a big new AI facility in, in Shenzhen, and they came to our lab in Hong Kong to learn about AGI. Baidu has been doing this for a while. Alibaba has, and then in, in, in US, you have Google and Facebook and IBM. So I mean, the, the biggest concentrations of people and resources are in the big tech companies now, I would say. However, almost all of the algorithms and ideas used in these big tech companies were developed by university professors and, and their PhD students. So the, the, way, the way it's evolving now is sort of academia is developing new ideas, publishing them in papers, putting in some kind of <laughs> crappy but functional open source code. Then big companies hire those PhD students and master students and so forth, and they take the ideas developed in universities and they kind of scale them up and apply them to practical problems and may often lose some of the, the generality that, 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 they, that they started with. Yeah, but that's, that's sort of, generality. in some cases, but I mean, as Marcus pointed out, I mean, Google DeepMind has a couple hundred employees and they're expanding by hundreds more and some I don't know exactly what percentage, but maybe 30%, some non-trivial percentage of their group is really working on AGI R&D instead of demos or practical projects. And by Baidu, I, I, I know better, because I've been to their headquarters more often in, in Beijing, and that, 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 that's similar. I mean, they've got hundreds of, of AI staff, and they, they have a bunch of teams just working on, like, trying to make AGI control little animated agents in virtual worlds, like p pure AGI-ish research projects. So, I mean, the big companies are doing that as, as, as well as doing practical stuff. Now, what, what they're up against... Open what AI is solely dedicated, right, to AGI, right? And they're um, not big yet, but well, they have a billion dollars of funding. I was at the Open AGI unconference last year, and I, I would have to say, Every single thing presented there was an application of an already existing deep neural net software program to some new application area. So in, in principle, in some sense, they're oriented toward AGI, but I, I didn't, at that point, I, I did not see any like, exciting new innovation or initiative toward AGI. I mean, much less than I see in DeepMind or, or Baidu. But they, they do have that, that aspiration. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why it's sort of a, a difficult question to answer because we don't, no one has a solid knowledge of how to build an AGI, right? So if, if someone says, I'm working on this narrow AI system and I believe it can eventually be generalized to turn into an AGI, I mean, I might not believe that it will work, but I don't have a proof that it won't work. And it's research, so every direction has a, has a certain, certain validity to it. Well, what's changed, though, is now, unlike 10 years ago or even five years ago, you can tell your boss in the university or your, your boss in your research lab in the company that you are working toward AGI as your goal while, while working through some incremental steps to get there, and they won't like, laugh, laugh you out of the room or, or something, right? So it's, it is now taken seriously as a pursuit, even though people want it to be balanced with things that will give a shorter term, shorter term reward and outcome, and that that that's a huge attitudinal difference, which I think is is going to lead to much more rapid progress toward toward AGI. I mean, having people not be afraid to work on it is certainly certainly a first step to encouraging progress. Let's get in some more questions. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's been referred to a few times about ownership of AI, but do you think it's actually the right approach to think that we will own an intelligence we hope will be matching our own? And do you think that we even could convince an intelligence that's greater than our own that a human owns it? No. But, I mean, initially it will be owned by, by companies, organizations who develop it, but quite soon, you know, it will not be owned anymore, you know, right? The freeing of slaves. Right, so they will 
Or the growing up of children. You know, oh, yeah. The, uh, I don't think we should see AI as robots. AI is not going to live next to us. We are going to live inside of AI. Right? It's going to be intelligent systems. Robots is going to be a limb of these systems. It's uh, going to be the physical emanation of this. But uh, minds are information processing systems. And uh, the physical realization where that server stands is not really the point. Uh, when but that ben doesn't change the ownership yeah. question. But Ben says things like we should make the AI love us. Of course, this is uh, terrifying, this idea that you create a superhuman slave that still loves you and gets friend-zoned. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's horrible, isn't it? Uh, but I don't it's think probably it not going be, to happen. I don't think it should be a slave, Josh. I don't know where you came up with that from. No, it should serve <laughs> us uh, freely because it loves us. Well, that's different than being a slave. No. Yeah. I don't think you're gonna. If have it does, any doesn't have agency ownership. about that love, it is. It's well, who says it doesn't have agency? Yeah, so does your wife love you? Yes, but do she, you own she, her? Uh, no, she, she, no she made that choice. <laughs> it, it did build this into her. It was a choice okay. by her, and she can't well, change that choice. Evolution built into her the propensity. The general capacity. Evolution yeah. built into her the propensity to love some man who acted toward her in a certain way. And she was she evolution created us that way, and the evolution also created some sociopaths. And we can, I mean, by our choice in engineering and teaching the AI, we can either make it be more like a sociopath or more like a loving person. Being loving doesn't imply lack of agency. Don't try to defend it. You're just making it worse. <laughs> <laughs> now, which motivations do you want to then build into the system? Or do you b believe that you build systems without any motivational basis? Uh, it really depends what uh, the purpose of the system is. When you build a general problem-solving system that you want to apply to a given task, you should probably give it the goal function of that given task. And uh, the main danger for us, of course, if the goal function of that system is participation and evolution, and we are in direct competition with it because we are going to lose it because its approximation of the, the necessary behavior is probably going to be better than ours. Okay, so what is then a task which you, you or people should give these systems? It really depends on the context, an arbitrary task that we choose. It could be, for instance, so uh, solving the problem of governance. Governance is not very well solved. We don't know how to incentivize the governors to uh, govern us in a way that is consistent with the common good, in the best way. It is uh, a difficult problem throughout human history, and we haven't really, really solved it. And it's so you prefer issue. robots who govern us rather than robots who love it's, us? It's not about robots. <laughs> it's about uh, yeah, sorry. You know, information processing Agents. systems. Yes, yeah, information yeah, sure, processing yeah. systems. Uh, we probably need something <laughs> like a, a nervous system for this planet. We as a species act like we are parasites on this planet, like lice in the fur of Gaia. And we are not th like this anymore because we have completely subdued this planet. We can no longer treat it as an externality. We can no longer be parasites. We have, to have, uh, we have to be the nervous system of this planet. And no organism can afford to have a nervous system that lies to itself. Yet all our modes of knowledge creation about how society works and policy should be enacted are completely corrupted by local well, interests. Yosha, so this so is something so that AI can solve. If you really prefer, I'll program the AI to love all humans except you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but look, you're coming up with a long list of things what the system could do. But what if you replace love by care? Yeah? So systems which care about us. So you described goals, which means they care about us, you know, about the survival, about governance, about and not exploiting um, resources and so on. That means all these goals are part of the bigger goal of caring for humans. Maybe that's a better yeah. word. I, I think I understand what you mean. Uh, I just uh, currently on a uh, mental thread where I think that caring is a shortcut. Uh, it's an evolutionary shortcut because uh, evolution didn't know the incentive function yet. If we care about something, it distorts our world model. If we have fears, desires, and love, it's a distortion of the ideal world model. If uh, you just have the incentive to say, I want to uh, maximize the chance that my offspring survives, you don't need motherly love. But, well, but, but uh, nature did have a way to bite this directly into our brain, so we have this proxy of motherly love. Motherly love is very close to it, but it's not the same thing. It has side effects. These side effects means that a mother might die if her child dies, that she lies awake at night even if nothing uh, threatens her child, and so on and so on. Uh, these are things that a completely rational system that optimally tends to the task wouldn't do. Uh, so I, I think an AI can solve these problems without caring, and for the same reason as a chess computer can win a chess without caring. No, it's a chess computer necessary. cares about winning. No. 
Well, <laughs> no, it's completely Joshua, undisputed. I mean, I, I it, it loses or wins. No, maybe not for chess, but it, for Go is definitely the case, right? It's a, re <laughs> 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 it's a reinforcement learning system, right? You know, and, and, and what does, I mean, I know, of course, you know, it's not conscious about itself and it's not at the level where, where, where it has developed feelings, but I mean, it's a reinforcement learning algorithm which tries to maximize reward, yeah? And then, you know, what does caring mean, right? Um, it means I not being a stoic about this particular thing. You can solve life as a stoic if you understand what's going on. This uh, caring is an, uh, a situation in which you feel pleasure and pain. No, you can't build I an AI without pleasure and pain. I think pain. if you're stoic and super rational, you wouldn't do anything. Why should you? Uh, because you have an objective function. Yeah, how is an objective function sort of... And if we instantiate this objective function as caring for humans, uh, my computer executes uh, Keynote right now, uh, and that's not because it cares. It doesn't have pain when it doesn't execute Keynote. It's just a causal structure that's built into that system. Uh, I, I just don't, I, I, I think if you try to precisely specify tasks for an a a a G AGI system, you will find you get behaviors that are not what you wanted or expected because the tasks that are relevant to us in our life are defined kind of nebulously and, and, and imprecisely. I mean, when you say improve governance, that's quite vague. And to really understand what those vague words mean, I mean, the system has to have a huge amount of, of, of tacit understanding, which, and, which, which means that the way that AI interprets your vague statement depends on its own motivation and, 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 and it's, it's world view. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see how you're going to get a superhuman AGI that is just going to narrowly solve whatever problem that, 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 that you pose to it. It seems, seems unlikely. That's, that's how it's going to go. And how would you, how, how you would ever specify this goal? I mean, in a way that it's algorithmic, right? You can have proxy goals, but uh, what I mean is that uh, these mechanisms that people have, these pleasure and pain signals or suffering when you have a pain signal that doesn't end because you mismodel the situation in, in terms that you can model them and you cannot mo uh, uh, control that anymore. Yeah. Uh, this well, is something that uh, you would not need in such but a system. I, I, no, I, 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 I agree that we want a future like superhuman AGI system to form an accurate model of the world in as much as it can ba based on its perceptions. You probably don't have a big disagreement. I, 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 don't, I don't think that that contradicts loving people or, or caring about people. Yeah, and I think it's very unlikely or much harder to develop AGIs which are not reinforcement learners. Would you agree to that, that reinforcement learning is a good approach Maybe. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, no. but. So it's a discussion, absolutely fantastic. And I think one of the things you're really teaching us today is that our job is to learn and to spread awareness. Mm -hmm. So this is what people talk about and understand the general public, not just an interest. If you learn more about AI, you can become as confused as we are. Could you comment perhaps on the motivation um, for Andrew and to leave Baidu recently and decide that his purpose in life is to spread machine learning and knowledge of this technology as far and as wide as possible. Oh, I think you should ask him that question. I mean, Do you believe that it seems to be consistent with what you're saying, which is spread the market and the capability to build as far and wide? Sure. I mean, I, I, mean, I, can, I can see a, a, Andrew Ung is now starting an AI VC firm. And I mean, if you, if you look in the business market for AI right now, what most investors want to invest in is very narrow sort of vertical market specific AI, AI applications. I mean, it's easier to get investment money for applying AI machine learning to one little problem. So I could see how in his point of view, applying deep learning to one little problem might bore him by this point. At Baidu, he was overseeing a lot of things. By starting a VC firm, he can look at a portfolio of a lot of different little applications of, of, of AI and so that I can I can I can see why, why that would would appe appeal to him sure I think the worst possible scenario is where you have multiple AIs being developed 
real a AGIs by many different agents and they're widely distributed. Because now you're putting this incredible mm -hmm. weapon in everybody's hands. It's like giving everybody a nuclear weapon, hoping nobody will use it. Well, <laughs> Work so far. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we're still here. Yeah. 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 Question is, uh, I have a bit of a problem with uh, the discussion of uh, AGI and motivation. I understand motivation built into the system in the sense of, in the sense of uh, building in biases, predispositions, the kind of ordinary stuff we do now. Um, if you've got an AGI, it would seem that it, it would be simply aware of those sorts of biases and it could simply unwind them. Um, to have real motivation, you have to have a system to want something. Yes. Do we understand how to build wanting something into the system? I yes, and formal, so. yeah. formally, you know, these are utility-based agents. You specify an utility function or a goal, and then the agent tries to maximize this goal. And actually, there are real um, considerations. So is a maximally rational agent who is designed to achieve a certain goal, which can be a very broad goal, right? It doesn't need to be narrow like, you know, solving chess, but can be sort of serve humanity or explore space or something. Um, so um, would such a system be motivated to change its old goal, for instance? And you can um, more or less say um, that such a system will not be motiv motivated to change its own goal system. So once you have um, implemented or given it a certain goal, it will stick to this goal, right? So there we have some safety feature actually which we can prove, right? Um, it's not, oh, I don't like to do this, I just hack myself, right, and then I do something else. A perfectly rational intelligent agent will not do that. We have rigorous theorems about it. Okay, thanks very much guys for participating in this panel. It's, um, yeah, I think it's close to 10 o'clock, is it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks so much for uh, attending. This has been a wonderful evening and all of you stragglers who've stuck around, uh, 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 we congratulate you for your endurance. So put your hands together for the panel. <laughs> And also the audience, so thank you so much for being involved. And we have some presents for the participants here tonight, so... <laughs> okay, um, I briefly wanted to say we've got some gifts of um, Welshman's Reef. It's a local Victorian vineyard that's been promoting uh, critical reasoning. And uh, <laughs> it's a long story, but if you, if you see it in a bottle shop, please, please buy it. And I, I, th I think we've discovered the LD50 of a crowd tonight. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your efforts. Well, thank you. The other person I really want to thank is Adam Ford. And I think hey. we've heard tonight about all the fantastic conferences that he organises that are often for free or, you know, they're usually his own initiative. We have Future Day and uh, the Philosophy Conference and... Um, uh, the, uh, no, there's been the singularity science and science yes, technology yes. under the different names, but often uh, you know um, touching on all the, some of the subjects we've covered tonight. Yeah, and more. So keep an eye out on uh, science technology in the future. That's the main Facebook group because uh, there'll be more of this kind of thing coming up. And a big thanks to the um, organisers of AGI mm -hmm. and uh, and the four speakers who've offered their time tonight.